Okay, welcome to this final lecture on dimensional analysis. In this video, we're going to talk about making the governing equations dimensional, specifically the continuity equation and the Navier-Stokes equations. Remember that the continuity equation is conservation of mass for a very small control volume, and the Navier-Stokes equations are the momentum equations for a Newtonian fluid shrunk to a tiny little control volume. So we're going to make those equations dimensionless. Uh, since we've been talking about making um, you know, all of our variables dimensionless. I mean, it seems like a good idea to do that for the governing equations. And we'll see what kind of parameters come out of that when we do that. The picture here on the screen shows a, um, a large model of the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, this was developed, I think it was back in the 1940s. Um, so you can see it's kind of an older looking uh, picture here that they put together. But it's a scale model of the Mississippi River. So I think uh, I mean, perhaps that's the Mississippi River there, kind of scaled. And uh, you can see you know, various farms and uh, you know, tributaries and things like that in the background. They used, they used this kind of model long ago to take a look at uh, flooding scenarios. So how would flooding affect the near, nearby communities and things like that? And of course, they didn't have significant computational power uh, back in the 1940s. So they had to rely on scale modeling. And so this was a really big, interesting one. If you want to find out more about this, there's a, a Wikipedia page I encourage you to take a look at. It's kind of interesting. It's in disrepair now because uh, it's no longer needed. But, uh, but it is kind of interesting to take a look at how people uh, made these scale models. And, and this one was actually quite large. So it's kind of a neat, uh, neat example of scale modeling using dimensional analysis. Okay, so we said we were going to talk about making the governing equations dimensionless. So let's go ahead and take a look here. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to start by making the continuity equation dimensionless, and then we'll move on to the Navier-Stokes equation. But before I, before I make this dimensionless, we need to talk first about things known as characteristic dimensions. So let's say, for example, let me go back up here. Let's say I had flow around a cylinder. Okay, so we had some flow around a cylinder, and we have some streamlines going around it things like that. Imagine I want to set the scale of this problem. So what I mean by that is, you know, just how big is the problem? So first of all, what do you think, um, what kind of scale sets the dimension, the, the, the length of this problem, the kind of the, the linear dimension or linear scale of this problem? If you take a look at that picture, it sort of makes sense that the only thing that really provides you any sort of dimension, like a linear dimension in this problem, is the diameter of the cylinder. Right? That sets the, the linear dimension of the problem. It, it tells you whether you're looking at flow around a one millimeter sphere or cylinder, or maybe flow around a 10 meter uh, cylinder or sphere. Right? It sets the scale of the problem. So we could call that, that uh, dimension D is a characteristic uh, let me move where I put that. So we, we can call D the, the characteristic length scale for this problem. It just, it just tells you how big the flow field is here, right? It tells you whether you're dealing with something on the order of a millimeter or something on the order of 10 meters. Now, if I wanted to have a characteristic flow velocity in this problem, where, what could I use to, to quantify that? So we know it's, it's very clear that the velocity you know, here and the velocity there and the velocity here are all different from one another. But what sets the scale of those velocities? The thing that really sets the scale is that upstream velocity right up here. Let's just call it capital U. Capital U is the velocity far upstream. That would set the scale of the velocity field, right? Uh, if capital U was 0.1 millimeter per second, we know this is a very slow flow field. All these blue velocities would, would be related to that upstream velocity, that 0.1 millimeter per second. If it was 1,000 meters per second, that would also you know, set the scale of all these other velocities. So the upstream velocity is a good characteristic velocity to set the scale of um, the velocity field. So we could call a capital U the characteristic velocity. Um, we don't have to call it a scale. We can just call it a characteristic length or a characteristic velocity. And we can do this with other parameters. So, for example, the pressure. You know, again, we know that the pressure at every point in here will be a little different. But what sets the scale of the pressures? 
What sets it would be perhaps the upstream pressure. We'll just call it P naught. That, that sets the scale of all the other pressures. So P naught is a characteristic pressure. And we can do this for other variables as well. For example, let's say that uh, instead of a cylinder, we were looking at a flapping wing. Um, so, and I'm not going to be able to draw this very good. Here, let's, let me try to sketch out a bird. I'm ter uh, let me put this down further. So here's our bird. I'm really bad at drawing birds. I don't know why I keep choosing birds to draw, but there's our bird. So, so there's our bird, and let's say it's flapping its wings. So here the wing goes up and the wing goes down, right? So it's flapping up and down. What sets, so that's an unsteady problem, right? It's changing with time, the wing's flapping up and down. What's the time scale associated with that flapping? Well, you, you could relate it to the period of the flapping. So you could set uh, tau, for example, to be the characteristic time for this. So again, the tau is just the, the period of the wing flap. It's like one over, one over the frequency, right? So that just sets the scale of the unsteadiness. So we have all these things that we refer to as characteristic dimensions that just set the scale of the problem in, in the various physical quantities like, like length and velocity and pressure and time and so on. We're going to use characteristic scales to make our variables dimensionless in our governing equations. So let's, let's go, let me go ahead and show this on how it works. So let's start with the continuity equation. Del dot u equals zero. And we're doing this specifically for an incompressible substance. Uh, if we were dealing with compressibility, we would have um, some other characteristic uh, dimensions we'd have to use. But the ones I've just described are the ones that are significant for us. Okay, so we have our continuity equation. And as it stands, this equation is actually dimensional. The dimensions of a gradient, remember that a gradient looks like a, a d dx i hat plus d dy j hat plus d dz k hat. So the dimensions of the gradient are like 1 over length. And of course dimensions, of, so, so this gradient has 1 over length, velocity has dimensions of length over time, so the continuity equation actually has dimensions of uh, 1 over time. Okay, so we want to make that dimensionless. And the way I'll do it is I'll use my characteristic dimensions. So for example, I'll say that a dimensionless velocity, and I'll indicate the dimensionless quantity by a superscript asterisk here, like a star, the dimensionless velocity will define as being my actual velocity divided by my characteristic velocity, capital U. That capital U is just this quantity up here. So if we were dealing, for example, with flow around a cylinder, it would be that upstream velocity. Okay, so it's just some characteristic velocity that describes the flow field. And then we can do the same thing for the gradient. We'll make a dimensionless gradient. You see over here the dimensions of gradient are like 1 over length. So to make it dimensionless, I'll multiply it by a, dim, uh, a characteristic length times the gradient. L will be my characteristic length here. And I'm, I'm not going to use the diameter of the cylinder. I'll just use L just to indicate a length. So that's how we make our, our gradient dimensionless. Just multiply it by a characteristic length. So if I rearrange this, oops, uh, the U is just our capital U, our characteristic velocity, times our dimensionless velocity, and our gradient is 1 over L times our dimensionless gradient. And then what I can do is I can take those quantities and substitute them back into my continuity equation. So I can take this velocity, plug it in there, I can take my gradient and plug it in over there. So let me do that. So I have 1 over L del star dot product with capital U u star is equal to zero. So you will get a capital U over L times del star dot u star is equal to zero. And at this point you see that, well, in general our characteristic velocity is not going to be zero. Um, we have a finite uh, characteristic length. So we can go ahead and just divide through by those quantities without any problem. So in general u over L is not zero. So we can go ahead and divide through by it. And then what we're left with and all is said and done is our continuity equation in dimensionless form. It looks exactly the same, it turns out, as our original 
continuity equation. So remember this one up here was dimensional because we have a dimensional gradient and a dimensional velocity. But when we make it in dimensionless form, it looks exactly the same. And again, what we used for to make it dimensionless are these things up here. We just defined our dimensionless velocity using our characteristic velocity and our dimensionless gradient using our characteristic length. So if we if we make our gradient and velocity dimensionless in that way, then our continuity equation just looks exactly the same. Okay, so that one's not very interesting. We had to do it, but it's not very interesting. Now let's take a look at the Navier-Stokes equations and do the same kind of procedure. Here's where things get more interesting. So here's our Navier-Stokes equations. Uh, again, these are the moment momentum equations as I've written them here for um, an incompressible Newtonian fluid with constant dynamic viscosity. So they look like this. We're going to do the same exact procedure. We're going to define a dimensionless velocity using a characteristic velocity, dimensionless gradient using a characteristic length. We're going to do a couple of others. You can see here we have our, our pressure, so we'll, we'll define a dimensionless pressure using a characteristic pressure. That'll just be pressure divided by P naught. So our regular pressure is just our characteristic pressure times our dimensionless pressure. And uh, we also have a time here, dt. So we'll use, we'll make a dimensionless time, t star, will be the regular time, the dimensional time, divided by a characteristic time, like the, the period of the flapping wings that I used it in my example earlier. So time is just the characteristic time times our dimensionless time. So we'll make use of these quantities and then we'll substitute them in. Now the density and viscosity and gravity th those are just constants. Um, they're not variables in our equation so we don't have to worry about those. So we're only making our variables dimensionless. The constants are just constants. Okay. So we'll substitute in. Uh, oh before I do that let me just make one other comment about the Navier-Stokes equations. This equation is dimensional as it is right now, and the dimensions of each term are force per unit volume. You can see that here, for example, with the, the body force. This is like a body force per unit volume. So rho g is just like a force per unit volume, right? Or force over length cubed, if you'd rather think of it that way. So each term in here has that same kind of dimensions. So this is force per unit volume, this viscous term is force per unit volume. Pressure is force per unit volume. The du dt multiplied by rho is force per unit volume. And uh, this term is force per unit volume when multiplied by rho. The other thing I just want to mention, and we'll come back to this, is this equation is just F equals ma, right? So the forces here, we've got pressure forces, viscous forces, uh, gravitational body forces, and then the rho times the acceleration, this is kind of like uh, mass times acceleration. We call these inertial forces. So that's just another name for them. So mass times acceleration is called an inertial force because it has the same units of force. And specifically, this du dt is the unsteady inertial force. And the u dot del operating on u here is called a convective inertial force. It, it references back to the Lagrangian derivative, right? We had an unsteady part for the Lagrangian derivative, and we had a convective part. So when you carry the rho through these, we get the unsteady inertial force and the convective inertial force. So we'll come back, we'll, we'll use that those terms in a little bit. Okay, so let's go ahead and substitute in to make this equation dimensionless. So the first thing we have is I'm gonna multiply the rho through these terms. So we'll have rho times du dt, but I'll substitute in for the u. So we have a capital U, u star, all over d, and I'll substitute in for the t. This will be tau times t star. I'll do the same thing for the u dot del u. So this one gets a little messier. So we've got a capital U u star dot. Um, it was uh, one over l del star operating on capital U u star is equal to minus. 1 over L del star times uh, P naught times P star. So that, that, that's this gradient of the pressure, so it's this gradient operating in that P naught uh, times P star term. Then I'm going to have to write it down here, so no, I guess I have more space. 
So then let me go ahead and do the viscous force term. So we have the mu del squared becomes one over L squared del star squared operating on capital U times U star. And then the body force term is just still rho G. Okay, so that, that looks a little messy. We'll clean it up a bit. We'll pull these con this, this characteristic velocity in the tau outside the derivatives, and we can do that for all of these. We can just pull them outside their, their derivatives. So this will be a rho times capital U all over tau, du star, dt star, this should have been a vector, plus rho u squared all over L, and this will be a u star dot del star operating on u star, minus p naught over L, then del star p star, plus mu times u all over L squared, del star squared u star, plus rho g. Okay, so all I've done to go from this step to this step is I've just pulled these characteristic dimensions out in front of the terms. Okay, now uh, any of the terms that involve the, the starred terms, those are, those are dimensionless, right? So like this u dot del operating on u, that's all dimensionless. What carries the dimensions are the things out front, right? So each, each of these quantities, let me highlight them in yellow. Each of these high, yellow highlighted quantities has dimensions to them. The unhighlighted parts are dimensionless, okay? Because I've I've used I've put the dimensions into the characteristic dimensions. That's what it, really what I've done here. And each of these will have dimensions of force per volume, just like up here. Because I know rho g is force per unit volume, so each of these is really like a force per unit volume. So the, this equation is still dimensionless. And just to kind of highlight some things. Um, this first term is what we would call a characteristic unsteady uh, unsteady inertial force and it's per unit volume. Right when, when I've talked before when I was talking before about you know, this is like a pressure force per unit volume, viscous force per unit volume. I said that this term was an unsteady inertial force per unit volume. So I'm just writing that down. And I, I write it as characteristic because I'm using these characteristic terms. Since I've used a characteristic velocity and a characteristic time, this now becomes a characteristic inertial force. But it's an unsteady inertial force per unit volume. The next one will be a, characteristics, a characteristic convective inertial force per unit volume. I'm not going to write out per unit volume for each one. I'll just, you just have to remember it's per unit volume. So that term is a, a characteristic convective inertial force. It's the convective part because you can see this, this term that I'm highlighting here, um, you recognize that from the Lagrangian derivative as the convective part of the acceleration. The next one is a characteristic pressure force per unit volume. This one will be a characteristic, well think about it before I say it, right, characteristic viscous force. You're very good that you got that per unit volume. And the last one is our characteristic body force, it's gravitational force per unit volume. So each of these are characteristic forces. You know, just as we had a characteristic velocity that set the scale of the, the, the velocity scale of the problem, we now have these character, characteristic uh, forces. So this term that I'm highlighting here, that sets the scale of the viscous forces in the problem. This one over here that I'm highlighting, that sets the scale of the convective inertial forces in the problem. So they're, these now set the scale of these various forces. It's still a dimensional equation, okay? Everything in here is force per unit volume. So what I want to do now to make it dimensionless is I'm going to divide through by one of these, divide everything through by one. And the one that's traditionally used is that convective inertial force. So I'm going to divide the whole equation 
by, let me highlight, uh, let me draw a box around it in blue. So I'm going to divide the whole equation by that term. So when I do that, I'm going to get force ratios because I've, all these things are characteristic forces. So when I divide through by one of these, I'll get a ratio of forces. All right, so the first one will look like, uh, let me just, it'll be an L over capital U times tau. Let me write them all out and then I'll explain what each of them is. They all have special names. The second term here, the it, it doesn't have any anything in front of it because I've divided through by that term. So this one, when I divide through that first term by this, you can see the rows cancel out. There's a velocity that cancels out and then you're left with an LT and a velocity. So it's right down there. And then this one, of course, this goes away because I'm dividing through by that term. Let's do the next one. The next one will be a, a minus P naught over rho U squared. The next one will be a mu all over rho U L. That one you might already recognize. I won't say much about it just yet. Um, but I want you to look at that one and think about it. All right, so now our equation is actually dimensionless. So this is our dimensionless Navier-Stokes equation. Let me go ahead and box it in. So this is our dimensionless Navier-Stokes equations. Okay, so None of these have any dimensions to them. The, uh, and and the, the terms that are kind of in the, the parentheses here, those are all force ratios. So I'm going to highlight them. And then we'll talk about what each of them is. And they, they all have special names. Now this first one is a, the ratio of the characteristic unsteady inertial force to the characteristic convective inertial force. So it's a ratio of those two forces. Okay, just remember up here, this term was the characteristic unsteady inertial force, and this was our characteristic convective, convective inertial force. So when I divide through, it becomes the ratio of those two things. Okay. That has a special name and it's called a Struhall number. Struhall number or just ST. And it's just defined as this characteristic length over characteristic velocity uh, divided by characteristic time. So that's called a Struhall number. That Struhall number, that, that dimensionless parameter, by the way, this is a pi term. It's a dimensionless parameter, right? It's just a set of a force ratios. Um, it, well, it's a force ratio, so it's dimensionless. So that, that dimensionless parameter tends to show up when you deal with unsteady flows. And it tells you how big the unsteady forces are compared to the convective uh, inertial forces. So it gives you a feel for the ratio of those two things. The next one uh, is this one. And that's a ratio of a characteristic, let me put it on a separate line here, of a characteristic pressure force to the characteristic convective inertial force. And that one is called an Euler number. So it's just P naught over rho u squared. So it's just a ratio of uh, characteristic pressure forces to this uh, convective inertial forces. By the way, in common usage, people don't say convective inertial forces, they just say inertial forces. If they mean the unsteady inertial forces, they'll say unsteady. So if you hear me say, oh, it's pressure force to inertial force, I mean the convective inertial force. Okay, the next one, hopefully you, you sort of recognize that one. That is a ratio, as it's written there, of viscous, a characteristic viscous force
all over the characteristic convective inertial force. And that is um, one over the Reynolds number. So uh, it's just, it's one over the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is a characteristic inertial force to a viscous force. So hopefully you recognize that one. So that's a Reynolds number, or at least it's one over the Reynolds number, which is defined as uh, rho u l all over mu. That one shows up all the time in fluid mechanics. It just gives us a feel for whether viscous forces are important compared to the inertial forces or convective inertial forces. So that's a very common parameter that shows up in fluid mechanics. So a Reynolds number. It's a ratio of viscous forces. Or I'm sorry. It's a ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces. And the very last one over here is a ratio of gravitational. It's a, a, a characteristic gravitational force or body force to our characteristic convective inertial force. Okay, so that uh, that's what that quantity is. And there's a special name related to that one called a Fruit number. Uh, FR, and that's just defined as a velocity all over the square root of GL. Okay, so that's called a Froude number. Um, so that, that ratio right here is like uh, 1 over the Froude number squared. So let me just rewrite that equation in terms of these dimensionless parameters. So we'll have the Struhall number times du star over dt star plus u star dot del star operating on u star was minus the Euler number times del star p star plus 1 over the Reynolds number times del star squared u star plus 1 over the Froude number squared times, uh, since that's a vector I need to turn this back into a vector so I'll just put it as like a unit vector. Oops. The g over g here is just, just to make it a unit vector. Because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a vector up here, so I'm just trying to make it a vector there. So again, this is our dimensionless Navier-Stokes equation. But now I'm just using the, the pi terms that we just derived, the Struhall number, Euler number, Reynolds number, and Froude number. So these dimensionless parameters show up all the time in fluid mechanics problems. And they show up naturally because they're part of the equations of motion of fluid mechanics. It's just If you're going to model a fluid flow, you would expect these dimensionless parameters to show up because they're built right into the governing equations. And each one of these is a ratio of forces. You can think of them that way. So a Reynolds number, again, is a ratio of a characteristic inertial force to a characteristic viscous force. Now, why do we care about that? Well, it can help us simplify the equation. So let's take a look at the equation here. Let's say I was dealing with the flow where the Reynolds number was very, very small. Okay, let's pretend we're dealing with a flow where we calculate this Reynolds number based on our characteristic dimension. So, for example, you know, when I had flow around a cylinder here, and uh, I used the upstream velocity as my characteristic velocity, and d as my characteristic length, Right, so they would fit into here. Here's velocity, length, multiplied by the density, divided by the viscosity, because those are just fluid properties. And I calculate the Reynolds number. And then let me, let me pretend I'm dealing with a very small Reynolds number. This kind of flow situation, by the way, is called a Stokes flow um, when you have really small Reynolds number. It's named after a famous fluid mechanics guy and also a, a famous mathematician. Um, so anyway, uh, if we were dealing with a very small Reynolds number, well, think about this. If you go up into the equation and look at that term, if the Reynolds number is very, very small, then this term becomes very, very big. It's, it's a really important term in the whole equation, right? In fact, it may be so big that it dominates the whole equation, in which case you might be able to write our Navier-Stokes equation like this. 
to our Navier-Stokes equation could simplify down to a much simpler equation, right? Because if this term dominates because the Reynolds number is so small, this term is really important, then all the rest of these terms might be neg negligible in comparison, and what you're left with is just that. Just this term is the most important part, right? So by knowing the, the magnitude of these characteristic quantities, these characteristic force ratios, we might be able to simplify our equations considerably. And in fact, when you deal with Stokes flows, this is, this is a, the equation that a lot of people solve. I mean, it, the equations just simplify to that, and it's a much easier equation to deal with. Okay, so that's why we look at these sorts of things. By the way, if, if you're going to get a Stokes flow, um, we need the Reynolds number to be very small. So if you come up here and look at how we define the Reynolds number, let me make space for it there. What that means is if we want the Reynolds number to be small, we're, we're dealing with small velocities or small lengths, for example. Um, the density is in viscosity. Well, density, you're not going to change a whole lot. Um, you know, it, it'll change whether you're dealing with gases or dealing with liquids. They'll make a big difference there. Um, viscosity, again, uh, that, that can vary quite a bit depending on the fluid. But let's imagine we're just dealing with a very small dimension, something really small. And the velocities are just kind of typical velocities, you know, something on the order of a meter per second. Um, then, then we'd get a very small Reynolds number. And what that means is that the the, if the Reynolds number is very small, it means that the viscous forces dominate. So if the Reynolds number is small, it means viscous forces tend to be much larger than the inertial forces or convective inertial forces, right? So if a small Reynolds number mean, means that. So an example, as I was trying to mention just a moment ago, one way to get a small Reynolds number is to have a small length scale. So think about um, like a bacteria or a protozoa or a mosquito. Those are all very small length scales, right? They're all very, very tiny. For those uh, creatures, the Reynolds number that they see when they're moving around in air or water or whatever, they, it, it looks like um, a very small Reynolds number for them, right? Because if you calculate the Reynolds number for those those creatures, the length scale is so small, it'll make the Reynolds number very small. And so for those creatures, the world looks like a very viscous place, actually, because the viscous forces dominate over inertial forces. That's kind of a weird thing to think about, but if you're a, a protozoa moving around in some water, the world is very, very viscous. Okay. Now let's think of the opposite. Let's think about something really big, um, maybe like a, an albatross. Albatross has a huge wingspan, you know, something on the order of 10 feet kind of a wingspan. In that situation, the Reynolds number is not very small. Okay, the Reynolds number will actually be quite a bit bigger. And even in an extreme case, like a, a, an aircraft, like a Boeing 747, those move at very high speeds, and they're also quite big. So for an aircraft, the Reynolds number is really large. Okay, you, so... So Reynolds numbers for aircraft can be, you know, like a million or 10 million, much, much larger numbers. So for an aircraft, the Reynolds number is large. It means that inertial forces dominate. Remember that for the Reynolds number, it's, it's, a, it's an inertial force over a viscous force. So if it's large, it means the inertial force dominates. So for an aircraft, the world doesn't look all that viscous. Certainly not, not the same way that a protozoa sees the world. Okay, or how a mosquito or a honeybee sees the world. So even though like a honeybee and um, a 747 still fly through the same air, they see the world quite different, differently. For a honeybee, the world's quite viscous. For an aircraft, it doesn't seem viscous at all, okay, in, in comparison. So it might change the, it, it changes the physics of, of how, what kind of flow field you get over these things. So think, for example, about the protozoa again. What do protozoa use for propulsion to move around? They often have these scilla, right? They, these little kind of hair-like projections that kind of, kind of claw their way. Claw is not really the right word, but they sort of pull their way through the viscous fluid, right? They, they sort of look like that. Or sometimes they have these kind of spinning tails and such that uh, kind of corks through, corks through this viscous fluid, and that's how they move. Whereas an aircraft moves in a very different way, or, or like a, an albatross moves very differently. They have different propulsion mechanisms because the world looks very different 
at either extreme. Protozoa have to kind of um, kind of, kind of uh, pull their way through a viscous, a very viscous world, whereas an albatross and a 747 see the world with with much less viscosity. Um, I shouldn't say less viscosity, but it does, the viscous forces aren't as important for them. Okay, so it affects the physics of the world when you see it like this. Um, <clears throat> so you'll very frequently see Reynolds numbers in pretty much all fluid mechanics problems. Fruit numbers tend to show up when you're dealing with free surface effects um, because you're dealing with another way to look at a fruit number here. Is if you square this, it looks like a kinetic energy over a potential energy. So Froude numbers often show up when you start to deal with um, exchanges of kinetic and potential energy. So like surface waves. So a wave goes up, gains potential energy, goes down, loses potential energy. So when you deal with free surfaces, you'll tend to see Froude numbers showing up. And in fact, you've done an example, or I did an example problem. If you recall the hydraulic jump problem back when we were talking about the linear... Um, uh, linear momentum equations. That hydraulic jump, if you go back in that problem, you'll see that a Froude number shows up naturally in that problem because what you're dealing with in that hydraulic jump is a change in the elevation level of some water. So you had incoming high kinetic energy, low potential energy water, and then outgoing you had high potential energy, low kinetic energy water. So the, the Froude number shows up naturally in that problem. Euler numbers um, show up frequently when you're dealing with pressures. Okay, as you might imagine. And in fact, there are some special kinds of Euler numbers that we deal with all the time known as pressure coefficients. And then if you multiply the top and bottom of these by an area, then they show up as like drag and lift coefficients, like a, a drag force or a lift force divided by uh, this, this quantity rho u squared, you probably remember from Bernoulli's equation, that looks like a dynamic pressure. So we've got kind of an upstream uh, static pressure divided by a dynamic pressure. So this is a uh, so pressure coefficients look something like this, and then like I said, if you multiply by area in the top and the bottom, then it becomes like a ratio of, uh, of forces, so like a lift force and a drag force. I'll show that in just a moment. And then the Struhall number shows up when you deal with unsteady flows, like the flapping wings uh, I showed I described as an example earlier. So they give a feel for how important the unsteady forces are compared to just the convective inertial forces. So this Struhall number shows up all the time when you deal with unsteady situations. Okay, so let me just tell you some of the common um, dimensionless parameters we'll deal with this, in this class. So I've already described several of these. So I just summarized them here. We've got the Reynolds number. It's just a ratio of the inertial force to uh, characteristic viscous force. Let me see if I can center this better. So inertial force to um, viscous force, so rho V L over mu. We've talked about that a lot. There's our Froude number, characteristic um, inertial force to gravitational force. Euler number, characteristic pressure force to convective inertial force. And the Struhall number we've already talked about as well, un unsteady inertial force to characteristic inertial force. So some of the other ones, so these are all come from the dimensionless Navier-Stokes equation. So the other ones that we'll deal with frequently in the course are pressure coefficient, which I just described. Here, the only difference from the Euler number is that we often subtract out the characteristic pressure. So in a pressure coefficient, you just take the local pressure minus, usually it's the upstream pressure that's used, and divide through by the dynamic pressure. All we did was take that denominator and the Euler number multiply by one half to make it a dynamic pressure explicitly. So that's a type of Euler number. Lift and drag coefficients, or drag and lift coefficients, I've talked about uh, just a moment ago, C sub D and C sub L. That's just a drag force divided by a uh, dynamic pressure force. So it's just, a, it's just basically taking this equation, the Euler number, and multiplying uh, and dividing through by an area. If you take pressure times an area, that gives you a force, right? So this is kind of like uh, the drag force all over a dynamic pressure times an area, which is another force. Same sort of thing here, lift made dimensionless by a dynamic pressure force. So we'll, we'll deal with those frequently. One we've just talked about briefly here and there is a Mach number. And um, this one is actually 
You can talk about it in terms of forces, but it's more commonly talked about in terms of speeds. It's your flow speed, your characteristic flow speed V, like the upstream speed, you know, upstream of the cylinder. C here is the speed of sound in that flow. So it's how fast a pressure wave propagates in the flow. So it's a ratio of speeds. And um, so that's what a Mach number is. You can think about it. Uh, it's it's more, most naturally thought about in terms of ratio of speeds. But if you squared both of these, then it would be like a, a macroscopic kinetic energy, like 1 half mv squared. So it's like a kinetic energy. And then the C, if you square that, that's actually related to the temperature. You'll see this later in the course, but it's related to the temperature of the flow. So when you square the speed of sound, it's related to the internal energy of the flow, sort of the microscopic movement of molecules, or the internal energy, if you remember back to thermo. So it's a ratio of macroscopic kinetic energy to microscopic kinetic energy. It's another way to think about it. Relative roughness is one that we'll talk about in uh, when we talk about pipe flows, and all that is is a ratio of length scales. So E is a measure of the pipe, like the wall roughness of a pipe, like a pipe you would have in your home, you know, just a, a water pipe, for example, and D would be the diameter of that water pipe. So this is something that um, we'll deal with when we talk about pipe flows. So it's just length over length. And then one that we talked about with the Navier-Stokes equations is a dimensionless wall shear stress. And we call this a, a friction factor, or um, sometimes it's called a Darcy friction factor, just named after a fluid mechanics person. <clears throat> and it's just the wall shear stress multiplied by four divided by the dynamic pressure, pressure based on the average velocity. So this shows up in pipe flows. So we're going to see that one again. So that's a friction factor, just a dimensionless wall shear stress. There are many, many other dimensionless parameters in fluid mechanics and heat transfer. And we're not going to talk about all of them here. But if you really want to check them out, I encourage you to go to that Wikipedia page and you'll see page after page after page of dimensionless parameters. There, there, there are many others that we won't talk about here, but some, some other dimensionless parameters come into play when you start dealing with different kinds of boundary conditions or di different physics. So for example, if, you, if surface tension is important, then there's a dimensionless parameter called a Weber number that shows up. Um, and you know there are other kinds of dimensionless parameters that show up if you're dealing with heat transfer effects and things like that. So if you're curious about it, check out that Wikipedia page and you'll learn a lot more about it. Um, all right, let's see if I've missed anything that I want to talk about. I think that covers everything that I, I wanted to say. So uh, just to quickly summarize, let me just go back up here. Just to kind of quickly summarize the, the important topics here. It's always a good idea to make governing equations dimensionless. And it's true in fluid mechanics as well as any other field. If you have other, you know, if, let's say you're doing solid mechanics, it's worthwhile to make those equations dimensionless as well. And you'll get some interesting uh, and meaningful dimensionless parameters that will come out of that. Um, it's just, it, it's worthwhile to do this so you can see what uh, dimensionless parameters are important, and then if you know something about those dimensionless parameters, you might be able to simplify the equations uh, to make them a little easier to work with. So the way we made the governing equations dimensionless is we talked about characteristic quantities, like characteristic length, their velocity, pressure, and time, and we used those characteristic quantities to make our governing equations dimensionless. So we went through this whole procedure to do that, and when we did the continuity equation, it wasn't very interesting. Nothing really showed up on that. But when we did the Navier-Stokes equations, we got these pi terms or dimensionless terms that showed up naturally. The Struhall number, Euler number, Reynolds number, and Froude number. And they all show up naturally in fluid mechanics problems. The one that's really most important is this Reynolds number, because we deal with that a lot. Um, we'll talk about the Reynolds number frequently uh, as we go forward. Um, and they're all characteristic force ratios. So it's when we talk about a Reynolds number, which is the most important one, it's the ratio, characteristic inertial force to a characteristic viscous force. And it just tells us how important viscosity, you know, viscous forces are in a, in a problem, for example. And then I uh, just told you about some other dimensionless quantities that show up uh, frequently in our course, but there are many, many others that show up just in fluid mechanics in general. Okay. So I think that's everything I wanted to say, and we'll go ahead and end it there.